you for the invitation. And I would just wanted to correct you. I think we met actually in 1999 or 2000 when I was a PhD student. But you may not remember that. In any case, in Brighton, I think, uh, I was with Keith in Brighton. OK, uh, well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, thanks for coming today. Today I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing um, and talk, uh, give a talk that I've been giving in uh, various statistics departments uh, around the country. Um, and it's gotten a few puzzled looks there. Uh, because it's a bit of a different idea about inference. And uh, today I'm going to try and give a spin on that, on that work um, as it relates to some, maybe to some uh, quasi-practical issues in, uh, in data science. OK, so you can find uh, the uh, notebook for the slides for this talk with that link there. OK, so I'm going to talk about um, what you might say is a, the a, uh, you know, prototypical applied statisticians uh, uh, daily task, given a data set to try and come up with a predictive model, uh, maybe interpretable predictive model, and maybe try and give some sort of, uh, you know, a traditional report like a confidence interval or p-value, um, but with the twist that I'm um, going to try and actively recognize that we don't actually typically fit one fixed model. We have some algorithm out there that we're going to use to choose which model to report beforehand. And so I'm going to talk about using the lasso, which is a you know, I presume most people have heard about it. I'm not going to spend much time about the lasso today. I'm not going to show you the typical picture of the lasso, but it's, it's the algorithm I'm going to use. And if there are specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, and I'm going to try and point out the issues that you might worry about if you use something like the lasso to choose a model. Um, and I'm going to try and explain why, um, or why a data scientist should care about these things. And I'm going to try, try and explain a little bit about uh, selective, what I call selective inference, um, or the field called selective inference, and how it relates to this problem. So after that, um, I'll talk about, I'll have a few more examples about a slightly ge more general framework for selective inference. Now, as this isn't a, a pure statistics audience, I'm not going to go into great details, um, but I'll give a few examples, um, or at least one example of, the, of a general framework uh, that's actually somewhat familiar to us. Um, we'll see when we get there. And I'm going to talk about some more recent work where, um, called, where I randomize my response vector before doing inference. OK, enough about the outline. OK, so first of all, there's a few papers I mentioned there, but I've been doing a lot of work on selective inference in the last uh, few years. And these are some of my co-authors. And what I'm going to talk about today uh, is based on joint work with many. Um, so here's a long list, um, and there's others who I probably should add that I haven't added yet. OK. So here's the example, the, the running example. So um, we're going to look at uh, in vitro measurements of uh, drug resistance um, in an HIV uh, virus population. So that is, um, w there's a doctor at uh, Stanford who runs HIVDB. Uh, this is a database that stores um, very uh, various information from different patients uh, from studies around the world. And some of the information it carries is for their particular uh, strain, the virus in their blood it has sequences um, for those particular patients. And of course, there's a lot of variability to the HIV virus. So e different patients have different, slightly different patterns of uh, mutations on specific part of their viruses. And um, we're trying to understand how those mutations affect drug resistance. OK, so this is. Um, now, I will forget if, I, if this is an NRTI or um, protease inhibitor, but one particular drug, in, oh, it's NRTI, NRTI drug 3TC. It's a particular drug in the market. And we're going, we have 633 cases, so 633 patients' viruses. For each of these viruses, we have a measurement of resistance, and we also have their mutation pattern. And I've chosen, I've taken 91 different mutations, and these are all the mutations that occurred more than 10 times in the data set. Uh, and these are site-specific, amino acid-specific mutations. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the data in just a second. And my goal is you know, to build a model with this data set that's interpretable, a predictive model, and to, to give something, uh, some notion of how um, the accuracy we can estimate the coefficients in this model, or some st statistical assessment of the importance of the variables that are in this model. OK, so here's my design matrix. I'm doing regression. I have 633 cases and 91 columns to my design matrix. 
And what the, uh, ver the features look like, well, the, they're associated to a position on the uh, reverse transcriptase that's a part of the HIV virus. And they also have an amino acid uh, specific telling which mutation, from wild type to which amino acid do we have. So this is, these are the kind of features I have. And I have 91 of these. These are uh, different features that showed up. Um, you know, at position 43, there was a mutation. There was at least 10 mutations to the amino acid a, uh, N here. And I don't know what N is, but I hope you'll forgive me. OK. Uh, so now enter the applied statistician, or you maybe enter the data scientist, or I'm not sure what term to use here. But at this point, I just have a, a design matrix. And I have my response, which is also 633 long. And I don't necessarily have a model in mind. Um, that is, I don't have a traditional statistical model that I want to use at this point. Um, I have 91 mutations. I've, you know, they're probably not all important. I probably want to present my, uh, my uh, PI, some uh, nice summary that doesn't have too many variables, but I uh, want to have some, um, so I want to get rid of some of these mutations and use a smaller model. And the point is right now I don't have a model at this point. So um, I, I won't just use traditional inference for that specific model because I have to find my model first. And I would say uh, more and more this is the norm in modern science or slash data science. We're often collecting data sets much, much bigger than this data set. I'll acknowledge this is a toy data set, but it's con it's, I, I chose it because it's small and concrete. And there are lots of data sets of this size out there. It's not big data. But there are lots of examples where we're collecting huge amounts of data, and we don't necessarily know what questions we want to ask about the data to begin with. We don't know what kind of model we want to fit to the data when we collect the data. We're going to use some algorithm, um, some machine learning or applied statistic algorithm to choose some model. So we're going to explore the data first. Then we'd like to summarize our results and present it to the PI. Um, and we'd like to give some confirmatory uh, or some confirmation of the validity of the model that we found. And this is the sort of uh, um, sort of in conflict that we have um, in the way th I describe um, model building is that it classically, you know, if you follow through a year of uh, statistics courses, you'll learn lots of things about hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. And all of that theory, uh, I mean, that's the frequentist, there's Bayesian as well. But all of that theory really s assumes that um, you had a particular question in mind before you collected data. Um, and I argue that most of the time now we're collecting data before we have a question to ask. Uh, and so we can't really use these traditional confirmatory analyses uh, um, because we are violating this assumption that we had the question before we looked at the data. And of course, you know, we're all aware that um, if you look at the data before you decide what uh, hypothesis to test or what confidence will form, there are many pitfalls. And I'm just going to go through some examples and just remind you in some sense of what you already know. So you, you might say um, uh, what we're doing uh, is, you know, this is sort of, these are sort of common sayings in statistics, are relatively common. Uh, you know, if you torture the data enough, nature will always confess. And that sounds like a little bit, this is maybe a little bit generous reading of that quote. That sounds like we will find the truth um, if we use a, more, a sophisticated enough algorithm. Um, there's another version of this, of this quote um, that's uh, due to someone else that says, if you torture the data sufficiently, it will confess to almost anything. Uh, and that's probably more, I would say, a more realistic thing. This is attributed to Fred Menger, and that must be a mistake. That's not Fred Menger. This is actually a picture of Fred Menger, a chemist at Emory. OK, so um, I, I think in, in modern, in, Many instances, we're really sort of encouraged to torture the data somewhat to get some idea of what questions are interested, what might be interested to ask before we actually ask them. And we should be wary of um, this, you know, uh, saying, of course, that we we don't want we 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 it might confess, but we need to know whether this confess has any actionable information in it. Is there anything still there, even though it's confessed to something? So that's in a nutshell what I'm trying to provide um, in this framework. OK. Um, and some would say, well, why should I worry about this? We have all these neat algorithms um, that extract information from data sets that provide pretty cool looking pictures uh, that tell a nice data story. Um, 
And that's important in and of itself. There is, we extracted some information from the data set. Um, but I, that information, it's not really um, up for traditional confirmatory analyses. We can't really use that information and go to a journal and say, well, here's a, here's a p-value for um, this word cloud of, of, of coefficients, or what's important in predicting something or other in my model. Um, or at least we can't, if we want, uh, with using traditional methods, we can't, use, we can't report things like a p-value or a confidence intervals. Many people would say, maybe you don't want to report a p-value, or you don't want, and there's, like, uh, there's a, you know, a large, some movement in applied sciences to get rid of null, what, NHSP, or null hypothesis, NHST, null hypothesis statistical testing, and they say, well, we're just gonna, we want you to report confidence intervals instead. Um, that doesn't quite absolve you because if the p-values are wrong, so are the confidence intervals going to be wrong. So even if you don't like p-values, if you want to report confidence intervals, you should still be worried about torturing your data. Okay. So I think, um, uh, I think m many parts of the scientific community still, even if you may, may want to have p-values reported for particular questions, particular hypotheses, and if not, they at least want confidence intervals that they can um, give some idea of the accuracy of the, the estimates that you might want to report in your paper. And so we need something that besides extracting cool information with nice visualization, we need something that will go back and fit at least in the somewhat um, traditional scientific method of producing a, a confidence interval or a p-value. And uh, so that, that's what I'm going to, that's again, I'll repeat, that's what I'm trying to do here. And I'll try, I will get to it eventually. Okay, so now let's get, be a little bit more specific. Let's talk about torturing our data and who are two big enablers in this world. Um, these are two of my colleagues at Stanford, uh, Tip Shrani and Hasty. I should have pick, put a picture up of the book, Elements of Statistical Learning, at least in the statistics community. They've been great proponents of using complex models uh, to, uh, to fit regression, at least in the regression context that I'm talking about. And they, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the most common one is this algorithm called the lasso. Uh, and the elastic net is a variant of that. And here's, I'm not going to go into great detail, but the lasso and the elastic net, they are optimization problems. Um, so earlier, y, this is my vector, 633 long. This is my design matrix, 633 by 91. And we're going to find beta by something like least squares, but it's least squares modified by a, con a convex penalty. Okay. And then, uh, well, there's these, two para these tuning parameters that are ubiquitous in complex models. We have to choose them by some way, so maybe by cross-validation. And so... In some, I would say this is an example of where we're torturing our data. We ha might have 100 different values of lambda 1, 10 different values of lambda 2, and we're going to find the one that does best by cross-validation um, over all that large grid of data. And then after that, we'd like to go back and report something based on the model chosen there. But we don't have the tools to begin with. And I should say, uh, while these, this, parameter, this model has two tuning parameters, you know, many others are worse. I, and I wouldn't put myself in this same club as Robin Trevor, but I had one that had three parameters that I had to tune. So, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not coming, I'm not proposing uh, getting rid of models with tuning parameters, but um, I want to try and give inference, valid inference after um, using these models that have tuning parameters. Okay, so now let's see, what, what kind of thing do these, this lasso or elastic net, what kind of information does it give you? Um, so here's a, a sort of an example y you might see from someone who, I mean, uh, this is not a real necessarily scientific example, but this is an example of the kind of information um, that you might get, you might extract from a regression problem with the lasso. So this word cloud here uh, is a word cloud wh where size measures the size of coefficients in a model where we are trying to predict a review score, in this case from IMDB uh, review database. Uh, based on the words in the review. And this is for the subgenre of horror movies. And so you th see things like blob and other scariest. Those are obviously important, uh, probably important words. Uh, and in many cases, I must confess, uh, this is sort of the end of the road for these methods, right? Uh, 
we have a data set. We use some nice, comp, comp, you know, rich algorithm to, uh, to find a model. And then we find coefficients. Here we can see the size of the coefficients. And we sort of stare at them for a little while. And that's kind of the end of the road, at least as in, my, in my experience, listening to applied versions of using the lasso. And this reminds me of something that, uh, I guess, in work, uh, Matthew mentioned earlier in brain imaging, there's something that was kind of commonly done in brain imaging is we would threshold an activation map. And this would, this would not be words. These would be blobs in the brain. And then people will stare at the blobs and try and make a story and write a paper about that. And that is, um, so this, this is an um, analogous kind of picture. And so now when we look at this picture, we see some coefficients are large. Some coefficients are small. There's some information in the data set. But is all the information that we've extracted here, how much of it is actually valuable? And if I'm thinking of this as torturing the data, how much of the intelligence after I gathered by torture is actually actionable? What is really left there? Um, and we don't know in principle. And so I'm going to I'm going to try and give you a way you can assess how much is valuable after you've extracted it from the from the data. Okay. So just I hope all of you will agree that when we take a look at this information I've got from the data set, we can't just use naive inference along with these algorithms. And what do I mean by naive inference? Well, once I've chosen a subset of variables with the lasso or something like that, that's a usual regression model. And I could use any statistical software out there to fit regression models that would report a p-value for me or would report a confidence interval for those coefficients. And I could, I could use that as my report. But will that have any statistical validity? I think most of us should hopefully say, generally speaking, no. Um, uh, and uh, so let's just take a look at how bad this might be. So here's a simple example. I took, uh, uh, this is synth synthetic data, not the data that I started with. I had a 100 by 200 feature matrix. So not too, you know, it's not big data. It's just, you know, medium sized data, or maybe small data these days. Uh, and I'm going to generate a model for which the lasso is correct. So I'm going to generate um, a response vector y given the design matrix that has some uh, coefficients beta. So y given x is going to be normal x beta with some independent errors with variance sigma squared. And I'm going to solve the lasso at some value of lambda. And I'm going to look at two different scenarios, one in the case where beta is 0. And that's an example where I would have collected a data set However, my response really has nothing to do with the design. And I don't know how many of those example data sets there are out there in the world, but there certainly are some on the computer I can make them. So we'll see what happens in the global null. And then another example, um, I'm going to look at uh, the alternative where beta now has seven non-zero coefficients. Seven is not chosen for any particular reason. And they all have value seven. And se that's also not chosen for a particular reason. But in any case, that's the default settings for some reason when I generated this data set. It, I wrote the code, so I put seven there. OK. Um, and then, so now what's going to happen? We're going to fit the lasso. And in this case, there is in scenario one, um, every model, like every subset of variables I get when I fit the lasso when their beta is really 0, that model is formally correct, right? Because it's just that I, maybe I include 10 variables, but they all have 0 coefficient in truth. So that model is still correct. Um, and then if I got 10 variables, I would have, if I was using a regular statistical package, I'd have 10 different p-values uh, that test whether those coefficients are 0. And I could see, well, do they look like valid p-values? Can I use them to form a reasonable test? And scenario two, well, uh, this, in this case, there are seven true non-zeros. And because I generated the data, I know what they are. But suppose now I, I got 10 variables, and I, I, got, I captured at least the seven true ones. Then there are going to be three coefficients who are, whose true value is 0 in this model. And again, using the traditional statistical software, I could have produced p-values for those three coefficients. And I could see, well, does it look like I can form a reasonable uh, statistical test using those p-values? OK, let's just take a look at the two scenarios. So this is scenario one. Oh, that the axes aren't labeled very well. So this, this is supposed to be, this is the, uh, the distribution of the p-values. And nor if I had a properly calibrated p-value, I'd like to see this plot be um, lying along the diagonal. Instead, we see that these p-values are much smaller than the uniform distribution. 
And at 5%, which we can't see, unfortunately, um, there's about a 60% chance. If I, if I threshold these p-values at 5%, there's about a 60% chance I'm going to declare something significant. So my type 1 error is about 60% here. So this is when the truth is um, completely zero. Now let's look at it, that alternative scenario. Uh, and in this case, it turns out at 5%, it's somewhat, conser it's somewhat uh, conservative. Um, again, these are all the ones that have true coefficient zero and when I report the usual p-value from standard statistical software. And oddly here, it's somewhat conservative. It's much less than 60%. It's maybe 3% if I threshold them at 5%. But in reality, of course, I don't know whether it's the global null is true or whether the seven sparse null is true or whether it's one sparse or two sparse. I don't really know what the truth is. So I don't really know what this picture is going to look like. Um, I need, for, to order to make usable uh, objects, I need to have some reference. Who, I need to know, I need to produce a test that's going to lie, whose distribution is going to lie on that diagonal. That's um, the goal here. Okay, here's another example. This one. Uh, is similar, the same uh, setup as before, but just in the global null. And instead of using the lasso, I'm going to run forward stepwise. Um, so what that means I'm going to take, and I'm just going to do one step. I'm going to take the best single variable model here. And because the global null is true, all the coefficients are 0, I would hope that my test statistic, when I produce this p-value, is, is uniform, because there's nothing happening. There's no relationship between y and x. Um, and well, let's see what happens. Uh, in this case, uh, the type 1 error is about 98% uh, or something like that. So um, because 5% oh, is somewhere around here, and uh, we're up there at 98%. OK, so what, what do these three ex il examples illustrate? They illustrate that you can't just use the usual p-values that your statistical software provides for the model that you found when you use something either by lasso or forward stepwise. And the shape of these curves will depend on the algorithm you use in general. Question? So, so this is a, I was taking the, the I have a, it's a, it's a, I have 200 features, and I'm taking the best one feature model. So that's the, that's the feature that's most correlated with y. And then from that, there's a, a, there is a, a regression model that has one predictor in it that I could have used r to fit, or SAS or whatever, uh, or stats models, uh, and it will give me a p-value, right? It, like, uh, you know, it produces the z-statistic and looks up in the z-distribution where that observed z-statistic is. And um, if, if I had not looked at the data to choose which one to produce, then that, that p-value would be uniformly distributed. And this plot would lie along the line here. But it's clearly not. Uh, so the, What's wrong here is, uh, is uh, using these, this, this uh, st traditional z-statistic and converting that z-statistic into a p-value. That's what's, what's uh, breaking here. It's not giving us the proper, it's not giving us t control of type 1 error. OK. So am I making sense so far? So in these, in these examples, the, the, the point I'm making is, A, that, um, that the tools that we, ha we were, that were taught in regression courses are not applicable after using an algorithm to choose a model. And B, that the way that the, these, thing, these curves look depends on the algorithm we choose and depends on the truth. Uh, yes? So it's, be it's because so I've, there are actually 200 different z statistics, right? For each one feature model, there's a z statistic that basically tests whether the correlation is zero or not. And what I'm looking at is I've taken the, the largest z statistic in absolute value. And that doesn't have the distribution of one z statistic in absolute value. That's why the problem is. Yeah. Um, so does that make sense? It's because the, the, the way I chose it with my algorithm the thing I'm reporting is a function of the largest absolute z, and that obviously doesn't have a, the right distribution. Yes? So you're looking at the alternative of seven, three, nine. Sure. So you're taking p-values when coefficients other than seven Yeah, these were, the, so if I had 10, I only find three. Those are the, so the 10 has to include the true seven, and then I looked at the three that weren't out of those. Yeah. So those, nominally, 
if I had chosen that subset of 10 variables beforehand, those would be uniform. Right? Because I would have found the seven true ones that have three zero coefficients in my model, and those would be uniformly distributed, the p-values. Yeah. So I've conditioned on, in this alternative here, I've conditioned, I've only kept instances of the lasso where I actually found those seven, and then look, taken the null ones from those seven. Okay. So, um, so the, the, the output of these traditional uh, tools are going to be affected by the algorithm used. And so if we want to do confirmation analyses, should we throw out all of these algorithms, all of these cool algorithms that give us nice interpretable models when I have many features? Um, so my, the point of my talk today is, no, we really shouldn't throw out these algorithms. But we really somehow have, have to address this conflict between the exploratory part of the analysis and the confirmatory part of the analysis. The exploratory part of the analysis is the part where I choose a model. And after having chosen the model, that's when I, after that, I want to do confirmation. And we have to um, somehow resolve uh, this issue. So, um, so the term explore, exploratory data analysis uh, is, I think, due to Tukey. Uh, so this is a picture of Tukey. And a description on his views on exploratory data analysis. He really was a proponent of, of these cool algorithms, uh, though I think he described exploratory data analysis as a graph paper and a pencil. Um, so he was a little bit before. I don't think he turned the term data science. He did define bit and byte, but I don't think he and software. But I don't think he got data science. If it was data science, I don't think he would have used pencil and graph paper to explore to describe exploratory data analysis. But he, he was a proponent of, uh, of exploring your data. And he said that at the time, there's too much emphasis in statistics on this confirmatory side. I'm trying to give guarantees that control the type 1 error of some, uh, under some scenarios or other. So he said we should really start to look. We should use the data, explore the data to find hypotheses, to use the data to suggest hypotheses that you might want to test. Um, and if you think about the way I chose my model before, um, using the lasso, it chooses some subset of variables. And now I want to make a report because the, that, the output of the lasso algorithm has given me some idea of what might be interesting hypotheses to test. But he, of course, noticed, he noticed this conflict between, and as anyone since him or probably before him noted, there's obviously a conflict between using the data to explore uh, and using it for confirmatory analyses because there will be systematic biases if you apply traditional confirmatory approaches to data you've used to explore. And that, th those were the examples I just showed you before. That the traditional tools don't, don't work if you've done some data snooping, if you've done some exploratory data analysis. And this conflict is also reminiscent of this, um, this term, researcher degrees of freedom. That was, uh, there was a paper, I think, 2011, Psychological Science, on. Uh, on undisclosed uh, approaches that researchers will do when trying to build a regression model. Um, and they had some examples, much like the ones I just showed you, showing that it's very easy to, to violate your type 1 error control if you start uh, trying to choose a model based on the data. OK. So now what's the solution? I think I've probably used about half my time. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, to describe uh, the problem, I'm going to try and describe some of the, some of the solution. And, the solution I'm uh, proposing today is, uh, comes under the umbrella of selective inference. Selective inference has been around uh, for quite some time. I think we found a reference back into the mid-'80s at a fetch shift for Eric Lehman here. Um, but it's, and uh, you have Benjamini of the benjamini Hochberg FDR um, algorithm uh, is also worked on selective inference, but not quite in the context of regression models. They've been slightly different. Uh, problems and maybe slightly easier problems than regression. So one of, well, a quote I could attribute to him is, is the, says that, of course, if you apply an algorithm to the selected few, in this case, the selected model I got from using the lasso to choose it, then the interpretation of the usual measures of uncertainty, so the interpretation of the usual p-values, not, do not remain intact directly unless you properly adjust them. And selective inference is really, um, I would say, trying to properly adjust these usual measures of uncertainty um, 
that you do have some valid guarantees. OK. So in particular, the selective inference is going to it allows us to test hypotheses suggested by the data. So I can use the same data to suggest hypotheses and to, to, to do a confirmatory analysis. And that's something that we saw uh, is, has many pitfalls if you do it naively. And these, in what I'm describing today, the hypotheses are going to be suggest, su s generated by some algorithm. So it's going to be some function of the data that determines what hypotheses might be interesting. And um, while I'm allowed to test hypotheses suggested by the data, of course, there should be some kind of, there can't be a free lunch here. Uh, so we have, if you're going to use this approach, you have to declare the algorithm you're going to use to suggest the hypotheses. So in my case, if I'm using the lasso, I have to declare I'm using the lasso to choose my regression model. And once I fix that, then I can do inference after I've done the uh, exploratory phase. So let's go back to our particular example. OK, so this is a, these are a plot of the 91 different coefficients. On the x-axis here in tiny letters that you can't read from there, these are all the different mutations. And these are their ordinary least squares coefficients. So I'm, what I, the type of inference I'm describing doesn't allow you to look at this before you decide what to do. Not, well, not the, not the lasso, anyways. Um, let, you could look at this and do something, but anyways. OK. Uh, so we see, um, as maybe to be expected, that some of these mutations are, have a high impact on resistance for this drug, and many of them are quite small. So this, this position here is 184V. Uh, it's a well-known uh, mutation in the resistance literature. Uh, 65R is another one. Um, and I don't really know what these individual mutations imply, but uh, medical doctors in the, in the who, who, and medical researchers in resistance ha know that you know, these are well-known well uh, mutations and have uh, their own stories about them that I'm not going to propose. That I'm not going to describe because I don't know them. OK. But I just wanted to point out that these are you know, particular identifiable mutations. They're not just sort of feature nameless featureless variables. OK, so in looking at this, um, it looks like we could probably get rid of many of these variables and still come up with a reasonable model. Many of these coefficients are 0. So why don't I choose an algorithm um, to choose a model and then report my findings? And as I said, the actual f uh, flow through this um, really should, I'm not saying you should look at this picture and then run the lasso. I'm saying I, I believe before I collect this data, that there, a sparse model is probably, there's a, probably a reasonably good sparse model to uh, describe the association between 3TC and resistance. And I'm going to use an algorithm to choose a model and then report the findings. I'm not going to look at this uh, and then decide on that algorithm. But for the purposes of this talk, I just wanted to show you what all of the coefficients look like. OK, so we're going to use um, uh, the lasso to choose the model. So the lasso has the property that uh, for certain values of the tuning parameter, um, we have sparse solutions. This is a well, I, I'm not going to, this isn't a talk about the lasso, but um, if you've never heard about the lasso before, you really should look into it. Uh, it's quite useful. Uh, but it's, it's a convex optimization problem that has a tuning parameter that um, will produce sparse solutions for some values. And there's a lot of uh, literature on the lasso. Some literature is telling, giving reasonable, um, choices for where, what kind of regularization parameter to choose. So there's, I'll take some choice from the literature, some multiple of this quantity that I can compute by simulation. And that gives me a fixed value of lambda. And in, the, in this example here, lambda is 43 um, that I'm going to use. OK. Now, in common practice, people will use cross-validation to, to choose lambda. Uh, if I have time, I'll describe some version of selective inference that uh, you can use with cross-validation, uh, but likely I won't have the time, but I'm happy to go on into the question period um, w with whoever wants to still listen to me. OK, so here, for my problem, I'm choosing lambdas 43. And for that, all I needed was the design matrix. I also needed some estimate of the noise variance. For that, I'm going to use the full, I'm going to use the full least squares regression noise variance. That, whether that's a reasonable choice or not is debatable. There are other 
versions of selective inference that don't have to don't don't need an estimate of sigma, but I'm going to use that estimate of sigma from the fully squares model. And that gives me this value of 43. And this is what the lasso tells me. It gives about 16 mutations that seem to be important. 65R, this was one of them. 184V, that's the other one we saw. Those were two of the ones we discussed, and uh, 14 others. OK, so now I have a potential regression model with 16 variables. And I want to report um, finding from this model. OK, first, let's just take a quick look at the lasso solutions. I've also, I'm going to plot them on the same, on the same image. We, and we see the gray is the lasso, the red is the ordinary least squares. As is well known, the lasso is a shrinkage uh, regression method. And it's sort of shrunk down the uh, coefficients uh, from the ordinary least squares to be slightly smaller. OK, so now only 16 of the gray ones are non-zero. 91 of the other ones, of the red ones, are non-zero. OK, so what did I do here? I used lambda equals 43 to run the lasso, and I got these 16 variables. And now I want to um, re generate a report for my PI that will have some measure, some valid inferential property. And so what I've done here is I'm declaring an algorithm. This is the algorithm I actually used to choose the model. And for various reasons, I'm also going to report what the signs of the non-zero coefficients were. That's a sort of a computational simplification. But this is the algorithm I'm using. For my x and my y and some value of lambda, I'm going to run this code. I'm going to get an active set. That is the 16 variables. And I'm going to get the signs. And based on that, after seeing that, I want to give you a report that has some properties similar to as if I hadn't looked at the data, that has some confirmation, confirmatory properties. OK, so here I just. Here I run that algorithm, and just to confirm, that is the same as the active set I showed you before. OK, so now I have these 16 variables. One thing I might do instead of I could report p-values maybe, or maybe you don't like p-values, I could report intervals. So here's a picture of some intervals. And what these intervals are, these are what I'm plotting here is I've uh, taken those 16 variables, and I've refit the usual regression model. That is, I've used r with those 16 variables. And I've produced, um, I've taken the output of R's confident intervals and plotted them here. So these are like the p value, these have the same kind of problems that the p values I showed you before, in that they have no particular statistical guarantees. So these are intervals, and what property should an interval have? It should have a property that it covers something with some specified probability. Yes? Yes. With no intercept in this case. Yeah. So this is, I took, I had those 16 columns in my design matrix. So now I have a 633 by 16. And I could run stats models, uh, line OLS with that design matrix and Y. And I could find the confidence intervals from, all, from that. And that's what I'm plotting here. OK. And well, these um, have no properties that I know of. Uh, th that is, they have no coverage properties, just like the p values I showed you uh, when using the lasso have no properties that I know of. Um, so I, now I'm going to show you what the, the proposed solution looks like. So here are some new intervals. Um, the red ones are intervals that I'm, I'll try and describe some of where they come from in the re remaining time. And let's just take a look qualitatively at what they look like. Well, for this 184v variable, the interval, this red interval, is almost the same as the black interval. So it says for this parameter, it's almost, it almost would have been OK to use the ordinary least squares interval. It's basically the same interval. Similarly, for some of the other variables like 69i here and 65r, the confidence intervals are just about the same. But other variables, like this 75i here, what we went from a fairly short black interval to a rather longer red interval. And this one over here, 190a, looks quite long. And some would say these intervals are too long. Maybe I'll have a chance to describe how you might fix that. Maybe I won't. OK, so now these are intervals. I said the black ones don't have any properties. Um, what do the red intervals, what property do they have? Uh, well, they have a property, again, that they cover something 95% of the time. And well, what do they cover 95% of the time? Let's see if I can describe it. Um, well, 
there, for these 16 variables, there is some regression model, some noiseless regression model, if I observed my response without the Gaussian noise. Um, that 16 variable model would have coefficients, if I got rid of the noise, would have true population coefficients. And these intervals cover those population coefficients 95% of the time. Um, so there are parameter, well, there are parameters that these things cover 95% of the time. Um, what is time here? So, okay, so the interpretation is if I, if I use this algorithm many times and construct intervals like this, then I will have many, many, and time accrues. I will be accrue many intervals over time. So this is a frequency property of interpretation of statistics. So time, I'm running many lassos on many different data sets. I get many different intervals. And for each of those intervals, there's some number that it should cover. That is, it, you know, an interval, a confidence interval, it's a random interval based on the data that's supposed to cover some number. That's the usual interpretation of an interval. And 95% of the intervals will cover what it's supposed to. That's, so that's what I mean by time, sort of doing many da data analyses over a long period of time. No. Well, well, so I mean, it's when you say estimate, there's a point estimator that I would produce. Like, so you, the usual, these, so are you familiar with if I had not done, if I had not done any selection, if I just re produced a, these confidence intervals? Is that, so you, the usual confidence intervals are centered around the estimate, the point estimator, plus or minus two times your estimate of the variability. That's the standard confidence, and that's the black ones, right? So they're usually, they're usually centered around a point estimate, plus or minus twice the standard error. Okay, but those ones don't, and so those intervals, they are random because they, they're based on the data you put in to, when you called it. And they're supposed to, there's some, um, not estimate, but true parameter that they're supposed to cover. And 95% of the time when you do this, if you haven't done selection, it will cover that parameter it's supposed to. Okay, so these intervals, these intervals are not centered around a point estimate. Um, they're based on a conditional distribution um, that, uh, but they have the same property. They're intervals, so they're not estimate plus or minus two times something, they're intervals, and there's some number that's supposed to be inside this interval. For 95% of them, it, that thing is inside the interval. So it has the same mathematical guarantees that the, that the estimate plus or minus twice standard error satisfies. So that, uh, but it's not that interval. <laughs> It's not estimate plus or minus twice standard error. Um, so I mean, the estimate plus or minus twice standard error is rather comforting uh, way of thinking about confidence intervals because, well, what is it? It's you have your estimate and you have how accurate you think your estimate is. And the confidence intervals kind of neatly summarizes that, right? But actually, uh, statistically, or the mathematical property that that interval has is that there's something that's supposed to be inside, and 95% of the time, it is inside. And that's, this has the same property. Uh, well, it's still a parameter. So, well, so now, now there's some interpretation that um, there are many different models I could have chosen from these 91 uh, different columns. Uh, each choice of 91 different col of those out of those 91, like of any size, there is some regression model I could have fit, and that regression model has some parameters. And these are produced if I when I, the lasso chooses a particular one, like these 16 there are 16 numbers it tries to cover. If it chooses a different one, maybe 20, there are 20 different numbers it tries to cover. Does it count for all the models? Yes, so, so when I say it's covering a parameter, that is if I fix the model it chose, there, and if, if I don't fix the model it chose, then as I get different response vectors, I'm gonna have a different model coming out, and then in that case, this would be what statisticians usually call a prediction interval. So the thing in, so in the middle that we're covering is a random thing because it depends on which y I got. Yeah. So those are, uh, statistically we would say, 
when I think of them as covering a parameter, I'm conditioning on this being the model I chose. And when I just think of them as covering a random variable, it's I'm marginalizing out over the choice of variables. So I have an unconditional statement. So your last two biases choose your model You pay a price that's wider, yes. Yes, yeah, the, the confidence intervals are wider. Not everyone is wider, right? Some of the, and these you can think of, these are the parameters that might, were probably were easy to find in the model and easy to estimate. But there are some ones that are not particularly strong that the lasso has thrown into the bucket and you have quite a high uncertainty about them. That's why the intervals are wide. Make sense? Okay, and as I said, some of these intervals are rather long. If it turns out if you do some randomization, these things can be made shorter, and that material is briefly touched on in these slides, but I probably won't get there. Okay, uh, so as, as I've, uh, I've sort of gone, yes. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, uh, get more data um, actually may not fix it. Uh, bootstrap may not fix it. Uh, randomize, randomization can fix it. So uh, I mean, boots, bootstrapping uh, is not really making new data. It's, it's maybe giving a more, a, pro, a more accurate distribution to sample from, but it's not really fabricating new data. Um, the, one, the intervals that are actually quite long are the ones where the true effect is zero. So what happens if you collect more data is if you have a small effect, then when you standardize everything, like the actual effect in the z-score gets multiplied by square root of n, where n is the sample size. But square root of n times 0 is still 0. So you can't really get rid of the... So the ones that are really null, uh, this simple version I'm describing, getting more data won't necessarily fix those. But um, randomization can provably fix, make them shorter. But, okay. So um, we have some, as, I was, as we are the, we're facing this typical task, we have some data with no model. Uh, we have some algorithm to generate questions out of some big collection, and we're going to test some or all of these suggested by the algorithm. OK, um, so if you want a formal description of the mathematical properties of what I'm describing, um, you might look at these. I forgot to mention, there are, I put some, pa some pictures of students down here uh, that, uh, that were students I worked with at Stanford. And actually, some of them are, th three or four of them are actually around campus here this quarter. Um, and Yukai you sitting in the back worked on the last one with me if you want to find him. Uh, Will here is in the stats department uh, as an assistant professor now. And that's why I put their pictures here. So if you see them around campus and you're interested, you could talk to them. OK, uh, so there's a formal description mathematically of what this is uh, in this paper, if you're interested. Uh, let me try and uh, describe, uh, inf uh, well, it's described formally, but without all the guts, uh, what's happening here. OK, so as we were just discussing beforehand, I'm, I'm in the regression context. So I have a response y, and I have a design matrix x. And the regression model is usually that if once you know the design matrix x, y given x is normal with some mean vector mu and some covariance matrix sigma. Earlier I said this was sigma squared times identity. Um, OK, let's, um, that's how statisticians write this model. Uh, and this is a distribution for y given x, and it depends on the parameter mu. Usually we think of the variance as being fixed in, often we think of the variance as being fixed in known. We don't have to, but for what I'm talking about today, I'm going to assume that. Okay, and so this model, for what is a statistical model? It's a collection of distributions for the data for y, in this case, given x, and it's parameterized by this mean vector mu. Now, as, I, as we said before, for any choice here, e is a, think of that as a subset of the 91 features, for any choice of those 91 features, um, there is a regression model that I could have used, uh, like uh, LM in R to fit. And that regression model, there are some corresponding population parameters. There are E of them as well. 
And you could try and form, these are the parameters that my intervals are supposed to cover. So once I know the mean vector mu, I can write what the, the regression coefficient of variable j in the model with features e is. And I can ask the question whether it's 0 or not. So I can think of this in regression, the collection of possible questions to ask are, well, choose some subset of the features, e, and then maybe ask whether each, for each of the element of e, whether the regression coefficient is 0 or not. That would be the test. If I was producing an interval for each element of e, form a con a, an, an interval that covers beta j e um, and report that interval. So as when, I, when we do this for different y's, we're going to get different e's. So we're going to get different reports out of the, out of the software. OK. OK, so now what do we actually do? So, um, so this in one line summarizes uh, a lot of basically this whole paper on the lasso. Well, not the whole. OK, what do we do? We actually we, we take this conditional approach. As I said before, when we were talking about intervals covering something, if I fix the model that I was to choose, then there are fixed numbers that my interval is trying to cover. And there are fixed parameters I'm trying to ask whether they're 0 or not. Uh, and so we condition on the event that, so e hat here is what, the, uh, what lasso actually, the variables lasso selects. And z of e hat, this is my notation for the sign of the variables the lasso selects. And we just condition on the event that they are a particular one. And then, well, in, for any particular data set, we're going to have a realized version of e hat. Right? When I run this function, it's going to give me, for this y and this x, it gives me those 16 variables, and it gives me 16 signs. So there is some subset of size 16 of the 91 features and some 61 signs. This is a distribution um, I could use for the data. And it's actually a, a model, because it's indexed by the mean vector mu. And I just use this distribution for inference. Um, now, I'm not going to give you the, de the gory details of that. It's actually not too gory in this case. I'll give you a, a picture to try and describe what goes on here. But this is earlier in the regression model. I had a, it was a parametric statistical model indexed by the mean vector. Now, in this case, this is also a parametric statistical model indexed by the mean vector. And there are lots of tools in statistics to do inference in parametric statistical models. I'm just using that here. Yes? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not Gaussian, even if it started with Gaussian. Yeah. OK, and so we're just going to, when, and when we run it in practice, we're going to plug in the realized values and re make, report intervals based on those. OK, so. Um, let me try and describe what happens in the lasso. So this is a picture that uh, this is getting close to the graphic that Ali sent around that I was going to try and explain a little bit in the talk. This is an example of what happens when you fit the lasso in a concrete case. Uh, here, n is equal to 2. So I only have two responses. And I have three possible features. OK, so what does the lasso do? It, fi it finds a subset of variables that, that it declares to be non-zero. And I have also asked it for to, to give me the sign of those non-zero variables. So what, when I say that the lasso gives me a subset of variables, that means there are different sets. There's a partition of the sample space. n is equal to 2, so I have a partition of the plane. And in different regions, I, my function gives me different values. It gives me different variables and different signs. And this is what the partition looks like. And uh, so what does it look like? It's a partition of the plane into polyhedral regions. And we can describe these polyhedral regions uh, explicitly if you give me the design matrix x. OK. So now, suppose I ran the lasso on this, this y with this x matrix. These, these are two-dimensional vectors. So three of them gives me a 2 by 3 matrix. So suppose I ran the lasso. Um, with this particular, and the value of lambda, I should say, determines um, the sort of the scale of this box in the middle. 
But suppose I ran it on this y, then y was in this particular region here. And the lasso would tell me that variables 1 and variable 3 are non-zero, and they have positive signs. So now what I'm, what I'm arguing for is I'm going to um, take the conditional distribution of y conditioned on being in this region. And I'm just going to do parametric inference after that. OK, and it turns for the lasso, you can actually reduce the inference problem into something, uh, something even simpler. You actually just have to work out a, a univariate distribution uh, where you, if I want to, I think this is testing whether x1 is, uh, x3 is equal to 0, uh, beta 3, sorry, is equal to 0. You have to restrict the distribution to this one dimensional uh, line segment here. And I, I, if you read the papers, you can f find a formal description of that. Uh, but this is in two and three dimensions exactly what I've, what I've reported there. Uh, okay, so what makes it work is that this, um, this partition that I'm talking about is I'm taking my, my R633 and I'm breaking it into different pieces. And I have to be able to describe these pieces. And it turns out for the lasso, for a fixed value of lambda, you can describe the, the, um, the partition in terms of affine inequalities. So these affine polyhedral sets. And you can describe them explicitly if you're given uh, the design matrix X. And here, X sub E, you should think of that as the E columns of the, of the matrix X. Uh, you can describe the, the Ys that would give you the same variables and the same signs are all Ys that satisfy these inequalities. And that's actually enough to do all the computations I showed you so far. OK. So how am I doing on time? Yeah, OK. So um, I just want, maybe I'll wrap up with just a report, uh, just to show you what, that you, what the p-values p look like. Um, so I'll describe, OK. So I showed you intervals before. So you can also construct hypothesis tests of whether a parameter is 0 or not in this conditional distribution. Uh, so it's a parametric distribution, uh, and it's actually an exponential family. So I can, uh, well, there's lots of tools to construct tests. So what should a test satisfy? It should be when you use this conditional distribution, the test should have a type 1 error of alpha or less. And so for each particular variable in the regression model, each of those 16, I can ask whether the, that regression coefficient is 0 or not, and report a p-value, if you like. OK, so and I, I just uh, it got, it cut off some of them. I've just made a report here of, of the naive p-values. That's what we saw earlier in my simulations, where I, where I just used the standard z statistic, and I used the standard uh, the p-value conversion for a usual z statistic. That's what I call the naive OLS uh, p-value and this selective p-value. And well, just for this particular instance, comparing these two, um, well, let's see, which ones would be declared significant? Uh, if you used the naive one, those would be all the red ones. I haven't counted how many there are here. Looks like about 10. But there are some differences. So using this selective test, we would say, well, the variable lasso chose variable 115f. And if I had not adjusted for selection, the p-value here would be 0.01. It's less than 5%. So I would have declared that as significantly non-zero if I didn't adjust my inference. But using these um, corrected uh, tests, it no longer is significant at the 20% level. And I think I will wrap up there. I have more you can look at in the notebook. And I'm around for the quarter if anyone wants to talk about it later. So I think I'll stop there. Yes, are there questions and answers? Yes.